Fresh rounds of killings hit Kaduna as four females are abducted and a ransom is requested for their release. And as the November 2021 Anambra gubernatorial elections draw near, internal wranglings threatens to destroy the winning chances of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, APGA. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mariana Holm. Bandits have killed eight people and abducted four female members of the Anglican Church of Kazuan Mangani in the Kaduru local government area of Kaduna State. While the State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, uh, confirmed the killing of eight persons and the Kaduna State Chapter of the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN, confirmed the abduction of its members, saying the abductors were demanding a hundred million naira ransom. It should be noted that the students of the Federal College of Forestry and Mechanization, Kaduna, who were abducted three weeks ago, have yet to regain their freedom. But while well, joining me to have this conversation is Biodun Shomi, he is a political analyst, and of course we have a security expert, Kabir Adamu, joining us also live. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Yes, all right, so I'm going to start with you, Kabir, because you are a security person. Um, it seems like this is now a recurring act. It's like, um, and this time around, it's churches that are being targeted. Just last week, it was the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Now, it's the Anglican Church. And um, one would wonder why churches have become a target. Is it because they believe that these abductors believe that maybe churches would be able to pay these hefty ransoms? Approach it from two angles. Um, one angle is uh, the, those who are vulnerable. And by being vulnerable, it means what security measures have you adopted. Um, it could be, as an example, who were moving around, um, perhaps uh, with the impression that because they are church members, they may not be targeted by, by this group. Other, um, I know that. Uh, Almost everyone who is in Kaduna State and, in fact, in North Central Nigeria is conscious of um, this threat and is not likely to travel by road. Um, so I was a bit surprised when I heard that, uh, it, you know, this number of church workers were, or members, rather, were traveling on by road. And at a time that we know uh, the likelihood of being exposed or um, encountering these attackers is high. So it, it's one of two things, either because of what we call risk habituation, where you are in an environment and um, you become so used to the threat that you think the threat will not affect you, or perhaps because of the perception that, well, we are you know, men of God, and so we are not likely to be affected by this threat. Unfortunately, we know that these groups, these non-state actors, don't make any distinction as it were, between you know, men of God or those who are not, uh, as it were, men of God. They attack anyone that comes their way. So I don't think, um, based on the information available to me, it is a specific targeting of church members or the church, as it were. It is rather, uh, you know, as a result of perhaps um, this risk habituation that I mentioned and the inability of the church itself to take into cognizance this risk that exists in the environment. I would have thought really as a matter of policy, um, any uh, corporate organization or any religious organization as it were, should make it a policy that its members should not travel in group in such numbers because of the risk of exposure. And where they need to travel, then there should be requisite um, security arrangements to ensure that even where, God forbid, they encounter this bad element, then the, that security arrangement can withstand the bad elements and prevent uh, the, those members um, that, or that constituency from falling prey to the um, you know, activities of the attackers as the case. 
So it, it makes me really wonder because you have said that you know road traveling is supposedly a no-no right now because of the uh, activities of this man in that axis. So does it mean that the people of Kaduna State or the North East uh, or the North Central, I beg your pardon, have become some form of um, uh, I'm looking for the best word to describe it. We're now staying at home for fear of these people. Sh should, should it be the case that we're all shielding and we cannot travel on the roads that we pay taxes for because certain people are becoming a threat to that region and maybe even the whole of Nigeria right now? Does that not say something about our security in this country and how governors in states, because you know we always push the ball to the presidency and I'm not saying the federal government doesn't have a stake in it, but does this not make light of our security in this country? In fact, um, I would add, you know, beyond the federal government and the state government that you, you've mentioned, uh, to us too, uh, the people, we are partly responsible for this situation. Um, now, it would be very also, unfair to categorize completely that the entire, you know, um, road are unsafe. No, um, as a risk management specialist, what I do is do a risk mapping, or you could call it a heat mapping. So I categorize incidences, and then based on those incidences, I put them in a map or some statistical representation, and I'm able to see, for instance, where um, what routes have high incidences, and then what other routes don't have. So as an example, from the top of my head, I can tell you at a point the Abuja Kaduna route was a high risk route. I can also tell you that all the locations around Brindingwari in Kaduna was a high route. Um, lo location. So these are the types of um, security risk management strategies that I expect, um, you know, corporate organizations to buy into and then make available to their uh, members or their staff, as the case may be. Um, people travel, and how, why why are they able to travel? It's because they understand the risk and they're able to manage those risks. So we know, as an example, that if you travel at night, the risk is higher. Um, we know also, as an example, that if you leave early morning. The risk is higher because those are when the incidences occur. Um, so understanding this risk, this threat factor, and responding to them is the way to go. Where you disregard them, then unfortunately the likelihood is that you're going to be a victim. Now this is not saying that there are no low risks associated with even daytime travel. There are low risks because sometimes we've seen in instances where the bad element block the route even in daytime, broad daylight, and you know carry out their, their activity. So the risk is there, only that it's lower as compared to uh, nighttime, or as, like I said, location-based risk. Um, Abuja Kaduna Highway, good news, there has been a, a reduction in that. And why, why has there been a reduction? Because government took some action okay. by deploying additional security forces, by engaging with the communities around that route, and several other things that I don't want to mention here in public. So okay. if government take the right step, those risks would reduce. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Shomi, I'm coming to you now. Um, there had been fears in the past because of these bandits and, and the activities of abducting and asking for ransom that it might just become a big business where copycats also become, um, you know, entrenched in it. And then it's very difficult to tell who is who. Could that be the situation right now in Kaduna with all of these uh, ab many abductions and asking for ridiculous monies, um, you know, uh, as some form of payment so that these people can be released? Yeah, when you look at the situation um, in the country currently, you would feel sorry for our dear country. Uh, because the first question is, how did we get here? You know, when you look at the case of Kaduna State particularly, I am not particularly happy with the governor for some of his actions and utterances in the past. Um, I remember clearly, you know, when the governor made it known to the whole country that, look, um, they had to pay off people who were um, coming into the country from outside the country, you know, uh, in order to ensure peace and stability in Kaduna State. I wasn't happy about that because what we are simply doing uh, it was to encourage, what it did was to encourage, you know, banditry, was to encourage, you know, uh, dissidents, even though it could be well intended in terms of um, trying to um, ensure peace and stability. It has a of being the governor of the state, it's perfectly okay. He must have done it you know, with, uh, in consultation with other security chiefs within the state. But for me personally, I have another particular point in time that it's not going to solve the problem 
what we are likely going to see is a continuation or intensification, you know, of banditry. I will never agree that uh, we need to negotiate with kidnappers um, because it only prompts them to kidnap more people. There is no way how you kidnap people, you make 20 million, and you tell these youths who are in any case, you know, jobless, you know, not to repeat it again. They will keep repeating it. In the case of Kaduna State, there are different angles to it. What no one is sure is the motivation, not until full investigation is carried out, uh, no one can tell. But I can see that, look, there are possible different reasons for it. It could be uh, because of the religious tension in uh, Kaduna State. It has always been a hotbed either for Shiite against um, the Sunni sect or the Muslims against the Christians. So, and we've had that ongoing, and we've had issues of reprisal attacks against each other. The other angle to it, that is religious angle to it. The other angle to it could also be political. You know, there are people who are not interested, you know, in the stability um, of the country, particularly of that part of the country. They could be either Boko Haram sponsors or they could be politicians. I don't know. You know, these are things that um, investigation should, re uh, should reveal, you know, and they could also be at war. Then you also have the actual problem, which could be, you know, ethnic in nature, because we know many Christians are in Southern Cardinal and um, more Muslims are in Northern Cardinal. So given that situation, there are different possibilities, uh, different perspectives to this problem. So until full investigation is carried out, we can't tell. But one thing which is certain is that it shows the failure of governance. Well, you just, you, you just played into my next question because I was going to ask you how government should have handled this issue. Because, like you have rightly pointed out, there have been several killings, there have been crises in Kaduna over and over again where the governor, El Rufai, had been called upon to swiftly act on issues such as this. In fact, Kaduna has been named as a killing field of sort. Could government have, because of the experience they've had in the past, dealt with or put up measures that could have you know, reduce the level of occurrence of these killings and these abductions in today, I mean, as at today, because um, 100 million is a lot of money. And like you said, if we keep paying, they will keep abducting. Yes. When you look at the situation we are faced with, it's failure of government. We now have an army of youths who the, the Nigerian security services will try to recruit from. At the same time, we have bandits, kidnappers, who are also recruiting from the same youth. The question is why? This, many of these youth are not stakeholders in this economy. They are jobless. They don't, can't see a way out. They don't know what to do from day to day. You can see the migration of people you know, from one part of the country to the other, particularly the youth and children. So that tells you that wherever they are from, they can't see any way out. They can't see any hope, you know, economic hope in that sector or in that part of the country. So until when we begin to address the challenges, the economic challenges we are faced with, we will not be making progress. What we will see is that the security situation will get worse. Number two, the Nigerian police force is highly, you know, under-resourced, not only in terms of money, but in terms of human resources. You know, you have about 400,000 police officers to police, 200 million people. How are you going to do that? And particularly with spiraling crime wave, you know, with uh, with an um, unprecedented level of unemployment. You know, people are talking about 32 percent, 35 percent figure. You know, uh, percentage in of unemployment, youth unemployment. So we cannot create this army of unemployed people and expect these youths not to do something. I do not support banditry. I think government needs to look at this problem and face it up from when we need to ensure that we can integrate people into the economy of this country. They can be stakeholders into, in their own economy. Hmm. And this can be done in different ways. We need to concentrate on heavy you know, industries that can create multiple jobs rather than services industry uh, that we're doing currently. Uh, hmm. There are so many parts of this country where you hardly can find industries of any government presence, you know, in those parts of the country. I, then, I, I, number two, I would like to push you on. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Mr. Show, uh, show me. I, I'm sorry to push you on. We keep saying that until we 
until we do this, until we, we've been saying this, these ideas, these lofty ideas, and sometimes very easy and bright ideas have been thrown out there. Is it that the, our leaders don't know it, or is it that they just won't do it? Because if we're having problems with the economy and we think that you know, reviving the economy or boosting it will help take these people off the streets, why has it taken so long? I mean, I have known about and I've reported on, on these Kaduna killings for years, and, and it didn't start under El Rufai. So is it that the governments in these areas are bereft of ideas, or is it a, a Nigerian problem? Well, I don't think the government is bereft of ideas. I probably think the government is overwhelmed with the challenges you know, they are facing. I don't think they are bereft of ideas. They know the, the ideas are there. They know what to do. Uh, the issue is this. Um, how do they do it? You know, and that is the major challenge which they are facing. Um, when you look at uh, Kaduna, for instance, the governor is a very uh, cerebral uh, governor, a very cerebral person. I've had contacts um, at certain level, at um, the level of SNG, you know, with him. So I know he's very, he, he's very brilliant. But now he's not been able to deal with this security problem, partly also because he created part of the problem. Um, he, the way he has handled past crises, you know, in the past. I don't believe us can do it. We only need to focus on what the people need to do. Government keeps complaining they don't have enough resources to do it. But when you ask the governments, all the governors, including the president, what happened to Orosaye's report, where over 200 you know, agencies are duplicated, uh, what I would call quangles, you know, job for the boys, what are they doing about it? If you continue to spend hundreds and 500 billion to sustain these quangles, without creating jobs for the youth, then we're going to end up in this situation. So we need to liberate the resources, you know, being uh, centralized and being listed by the rapacious ruling class in the country. Okay. Until we do that and free resources for investment, we will continue to face this challenge. They cannot have it both ways. You cannot say the parliamentarians, the, the House of Reps members, the senators, the governors, and everybody should be you know, handing the kind of billions they're making from this system, and at the same time, you want to invest in the economy. How? You cannot take the money, you know, legally, take, you know, appropriate the money into your pocket, and at the same time, you know, wanting to invest. How are you going to do it? Okay. We are a country begging the whole world now for loans to invest in our country. But they also know that we have resources to invest, but it's just imponent by a few political elites. So these are the major challenges, and this future are not unaware of it. They see the SUVs on the road. They know how many Nigerians that have aeroplanes, you know, jet planes, you know, private planes in the country, but they can see a future for themselves. This is okay. the major problem. We need to go back, you know, to, you know, to what they call social re-engineering of the Nigerian environment. We All need right. to re-engineer our economy in a way that it's so responsive to the needs of the youth rather than the greed of the rapacious schooling class. All right, let me come back to um, our expert, um, Mr. Adam. The coalition of northern groups uh, in um, Kaduna State had faulted uh, Governor El Rufai's response to these killings and the kidnappings that have occurred um, and the insecurity level in the state. They have cried that there's been a long wait, that the government keeps telling them to hold on and wait for something to be done. Now, they're also threatening um, to, to protest, to go on a protest of sorts uh, about the level of insecurity. That on its own is also um, a, a writing on the wall saying that, look, all is obviously not well uh, in Kaduna State. Like I asked earlier on, Governor El Rufai has had his plate really full when it comes to these issues. And I know that there, have, there are several people who are handling security in that state as a person who is an expert, if you were called to the table, what strategy, what new angle should the government be looking at to deal with this issue? If It might not necessarily be put to bed immediately, but to reduce it to a, its barest minimum. What would, it, would, would that idea be? Thank you for calling me to the table. It's a rare opportunity, but um, I'm glad that I, that I have it. Um, a couple of things. And um, one of the things I would like to emphasize, and responding to what my co-discussant had mentioned, let, let as much as possible not try to reduce these issues to the single um, victim, single perpetrator narrative. These are complex issues. 
unfortunately, that have uh, been allowed to grow and have become very, very dynamic and transient, just like you, you mentioned. So in terms of the responses that would help address this issue, number one is the political um, you know, mechanism that is required to provide the platform for peace. In every system, especially a very diverse system where you have disparate elements um, tearing at the themes of the, our very existence, in some instances using forces that are beyond the, the average understanding of you know, the, um, the best thing to do is to adopt very good political measures. Um, you, you, you talk about centrifugal forces. Now, in a good political system, you try to replace those centrifugal forces by centripetal forces so that the dividing elements have now become uniting elements. When we celebrated our 60th Jubilee um, anniversary, uh, we, we celebrated togetherness. And I was of the opinion that perhaps we should have expanded it to mean uh, justice, equity, and, and fairness so that the average Nigerian feels he or she belongs to the state and that the state is providing for him. Now, that, this political platform is the first thing. If all uh, members of the society feel that government is working for them and that there is no distinction based on ethnicity or religion, then this tension will reduce. Number two is the security measures that are required. And one of the most visible security measures will be to dominate the ungoverned spaces. Um, it, it's strange, you know, when, I, when you, we use this word ungoverned spaces, some people would think, how can there be an ungoverned space within a, the territory of a country, a sovereign country? But the reality is that there are ungoverned spaces. A good example in Kaduna is Burningwari. Burningwari, the forest in Burningwari, has been where these bandits are uh, hibernating. The forest around the Abuja Kaduna Highway on both sides, in Niger State to the left, if you're, that, if you're living in Abuja, going to Kaduna, or to the right, Kaduna State, um, if you're living in Abuja, going to Kaduna. Now, all those forests remain largely ungoverned, where you have these uh, gunmen hibernating and using a heaven to perpetrate their activities, to so dominate this forest. And unfortunately, and this is where the discussion gets more interesting, this forest belongs to the state. They are not federal government. Most of them are not federal government. Um, you know, the, the jurisdiction for them belongs to the state. So it's the responsibility of the state. But the lacuna in our constitution is that security remains in the exclusive list. So the state, frankly, don't have the capacity in terms of human you know, security resources to deploy to this forest to dominate them. But then that leaves us the option of technology. And that's I would, the way I would recommend. We need to dominate this forest using technology and then perhaps a special force um, spe specifically for going into the forest and rooting out these elements whenever they are discovered. Where I know we, that there are a lot of Where are we supposed to get this special force from? Because generating I'm, sorry, I'm so sorry to talk over you. Where are we supposed to get this special force from? Because already we have the JTF overstretched. I'm talking about the army, the joint tax force. The police is also understaffed. So where are we getting these special forces from? Uh, within the people in the state or um, what we exactly? Do, we do have now, incidentally, there is a department within the Ministry of Agriculture. It used to be the Ministry of Forest, Forestry or something before. Now it's, I think, within the Ministry of Agriculture. And interestingly, every year we um, allocate a budgetary provision for that department. But the question is, what is that department doing? I've seen not once, not twice, the leadership of that department having meetings with the president, They've had meetings with the vice president. They visited the National Assembly. But nobody has bothered to ask what is stopping them from carrying out their function. As a child, I would, there was a forest right behind my house. And at that time, if you enter that forest and fell a tree, you'll be arrested immediately. Now, what happened to that department? Why are they no longer functioning? So these are the kind of questions. There are, um, you know, 27 ministries, departments, and agencies within the security architecture. The only departments we talk about are either the military or in some instances the police, and very rarely the immigration and the custom. So what of the rest? I just gave the example of this unit within the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, if they are doing their work, this forest would not remain, uh, as it were, ungoverned. So therein lies your, your, your answer. We need to look closely at that department. We need to train that department, provide tactical weapons for that department to make sure they are able to go into those forests with superior firepower to withstand the, the um, gunmen that are inside this forest. Hmm, interesting. Um, finally, Mr. Shomi, 
do you see us coming back here in a couple of days or in a couple of weeks to have the same kind of conversation? Maybe this time or soon, because I mean, recently there was another one. I mean, because it looks like this is, you know, it's, they're just taking turns around the country uh, to heat. So different parts of the country is taking the heat from these guys. And we just keep having the same kind of responses of talking tough and we will deal decisively. I mean, right now, as we speak, I hear that um, uh, the Kaduna government has um, um, arrested one of the people who were involved in uh, the kidnap and the killings. But do we really always have to wait for another one to happen before we deal? I mean, it's becoming a reoccurrence. Every single week we have one, if not twice a week, we have one story of an abduction or killings or how much longer can we keep having this happen? Because more and more people are dying and every human life is supposedly valuable, but how valuable are we to the Nigerian government? Well, <clears throat> Nigerians are highly very dominant. I do not think there is any governor or Mr. President um, are not interested in the um, securing the lives of Nigerians. But what I honestly think is that with the problem we're faced with, gradually the, start, the strategy of those who are doing the, kidnap, the kidnapping, kidnapping people, you know, for ransom is changing. We need to engage the intelligence services. Um, it has to be intelligence based because nobody's sure that those who are carrying out this kidnapping are not actually doing it to fund insurgency um, that is going on in the northeast part of the country. That is one thing. Uh, because we know straight away, once they can't rob the bank, and once um, they do not have access to money from outside the country through the banking system, then they will resort to this kind of um, behavior. And this is exactly what we see going on. I do not necessarily believe that some of those uh, kidnappers are not actually, you know, terrorists. So that is why government needs to be interested in dealing with terrorists and also those who are their sidekicks, those who are supporting terrorism through kidnapping. Mm. We have not resourced the police force sufficiently, and I don't believe we have resolved, resourced the intelligence services, you know, sufficiently. We could also employ, like my colleague said, you know, technology to deal with some of this problem. For instance, at the home, the forest, we can get some of the advanced drones, you know, either through the Americans, the Russians, uh, you know, or the Israelis, you know, to <laughs> buy the drones. That's a, that's uh, a whole kettle of fish on its own. We don't even want to get into that conversation tonight. But we're out of time. I want to say thank you. Uh, Biodo Shobi yes. is a political analyst. And, of course, we've yes. had the pleasure of Kaber Adamu, a security expert. Thank you, gentlemen, for speaking with us. Thank you very thank much. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll take a short break. And when we return, we will be discussing the party politics taking place in Anambra State Chapter of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, APCA, as the state elections draw closer. We'll be right back after the break.